If you have your uh, bulletin app, go ahead and pull it out, or your paper bulletin, either one. While you're doing that, I want to um, remind you about our connection cards, which you know are stapled to your bulletins, or you can pick one up um, by the offering boxes or giving boxes. And they're intended just to keep us on the same page, information, details about upcoming events, things you want um, to be emailed about or texted about. Uh, if you have questions, you want to talk to a specific leader, that's what those connection cards are intended to do, as well as, in my mind, the most crucial thing, prayer requests. If you have something you need prayer for, you write it on there. If it's something for our prayer team to pray through, great. If you want just a couple of pastors and elders to pray for you, mark that on there. Drop it in the box if you want to be followed up with that. We'll be happy to call you, pray with you. But those are uh, just a, a key resource and why we see those as so valuable, those connection cards. So make good use of them. The journey. Hopefully you've been uh, able to plug along in scripture. We have well over 100 folks from our church family who've committed to read through all of scripture this year, which is amazing. Amen? That's lame. Amen? Like digging into God's word, seeing who, who his people have grown to be. I mean, I'm just super encouraged seeing, you know, Jacob and how he treats his sons and isn't always a deceiver in the end. So it's great stuff. So I want to encourage you to spend time following through, reading. And if you want to jump in now, it is a great time. You can always catch up. Um, there's a time at the grind at 7 p.m. on Sunday nights this evening where they read through that week's um, section of Scripture apart from the Psalms. Um, but jump in anytime. It's a great thing to be able to, in God's word, having a hundred plus people, you know, reading with you where you can grab someone and say, hey, what did you think about this today or this week or the reading? And I just, it's been great for me. It's, people have encouraged me and I've encouraged others. The family project. What is the family project? If you have thoughts, questions about family and how God's designed it, relationships, whether it's with your spouse or kids, how does all that connect? Scott is leading um, the charge on this family project, and it is taking place here from February 11th through March 18th at six sessions, um, part of its video, part of its interaction, uh, but just a good opportunity to, to really engage with you, your spouse, maybe your kids on how, how do we live out God's call as a family? How do we do that together and effectively for the kingdom? Because... Family's his institution, right? He created it in the beginning. If you, um, I'm wondering what age is it appropriate for me to jump in on this? Adults all the way through high school, he said, uh, Scott said, would be a really healthy group to be there. So consider being a part of that. Um, is it too huge of a time commitment? A couple hours for six sessions during that. So if you have questions about it, mark it off in your connection card and we'll follow up with you. Faith in the field. I hope that uh, men, if you got your sons with you, ladies, maybe even if you really are excited about being outdoors, going hunting, that kind of stuff, Faith in the Field is a good opportunity where Jeremy Adamson, where at, Jeremy? Put your hand up. You could stand up because you're a decently tall guy as well. If you wanted to. All right, don't sit there. Sit. Fine. That's, I'm good with that. Um, he's done a great job pulling together uh, this ministry opportunity on February 25th, right here, there will be an auction, desserts, there's a great movie that they come in playing here, and you can engage your boys and say, hey, how do we get out into the wilderness? How do we get in God's creation and see all that he's done, and fathers and sons, grandparents and grandsons, whatever, whatever it looks like, do it together, and worship. So, come do that with some other men, check it out. If you have questions, you can go talk to the guy who won't stand up, but he'll put his hand up for you at least few things before we uh, step into the word today. I want to just make sure all the ladies look at that insert you have in your uh, bulletin that's on your app about Bible studies for you particularly that are coming soon right around the corner. Great things are offered and I hope you'll plug into that. There's uh, always great opportunities and we just need to make sure we shape our lives in ways that we can take advantage of those opportunities. Children, you ready to go? God bless you as you're dismissed. I want to remind all the parents and even grandparents, there's a great resource at the children's ministry table that's free to you. It's 
It's about the greatest story ever told, the story about Jesus. It's a, the picture Bible for children. It's a great resource. Grandparents, uh, if you can use this with your grandchildren, please do so. It's a great resource. We're just asking you to sign and let us know that you have that. That way we can maybe encourage you through the year on using that with your children. We're going to have the scripture read for us today that we are going to be looking at. It's Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. It will be up on the screen. I encourage you, if you want to, to look at it in your Bible as well. Brianna is down here. She's going to come and read that for us. Thank you, Brianna. Would you stand together for the reading of God's word and the truth that is declared there? Go ahead. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Thank you. You may be seated. Familiar portions of God's word are very dangerous. They kind of sneak up on us sometimes. The words that Brianna just read are very familiar words. They're often quoted and read. I read this week that familiarity crowds out curiosity. It imperceptibly stiffens necks, hardens hearts, and deafen ears. Familiarity may lead us to assume things that are not in the text and may blind us to things that are. Sometimes familiar passages we go heart blind to. They don't make an impact because we've heard them over and over again. Thousands of sermons have been preached on these words and you're going to hear another one today. Will we hear what God wants us to hear in them? Let's pray that we do. Father God, thank you for these words spoken thousands of years ago, written thousands of years ago, but alive and powerful to shape us. And Lord, please do that. Holy Spirit, teach us, drive truths into parts of our hearts that we maybe have closed off, become hard to. Jesus, we ask this for your glory. Amen. I ended our message last week with a warning. I want to begin with that same warning. Please do not take the words that you just heard as a to-do list to get into heaven. As a list of things you need to be working on to get better at. Remember, there were lots of voices that people in the day heard when Jesus spoke these words. And those were to-do lists primarily. You need to do this, you need to do this, you need to stop doing this, and then it will all be right with you. And yet Jesus speaks a different message. This is not a to-do list. And Jesus' words as he speaks them are in conflict with all those other voices. Because he stands on that hillside and he stands before us today even and says, this is the truth about my kingdom. And it's a kingdom that is greater than any other kingdom. By the way, our government is shut down, but the kingdom of God is not. Amen? It keeps on moving, regardless of whatever kingdom is in power or whatever political party is ruling. Jesus stands and says, I am the king of this kingdom. Hear my truth, receive my truth, reject all the other voices. That would be another way of saying repent. Reject it, follow me, and experience these things that I speak to you about. And Jesus, I think, would warn us, Don't think you can bring something into my kingdom that we need. 
Don't think that, that you can bring something valuable because you have nothing, but you have everything that my kingdom has to offer. So he said, this kingdom is a place of humility. This kingdom is a place where sin is seen for what it is. This kingdom is a place where the gentle, the meek, reign and rule. This kingdom, my kingdom, is a place where there's satisfaction because there is a hunger and thirst for righteousness. This kingdom is a place where mercy flows in all relationships. Understand, when Jesus first spoke those words, they weren't familiar. They were captivating and fascinating, and I pray that they'll be that same way for us to draw us into his kingdom. So let's pick it up where we ended last week, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The kingdom of heaven, he says, is a place where God is seen, known, and experienced. And that, no doubt, those words created a dissonance in the mind of those listeners, primary Jewish listeners, because they were accustomed to a God that was untouchable and distant and certainly unseeable. They were familiar with what God told Moses when Moses says, I want to see you, and God says, you can't see my face, for no man can see me and live. In other words, if you saw me, you'd be dead. But of course, Jesus is not speaking about physical seeing. He's talking about seeing with our hearts, with the eyes of our hearts. He's not concerned that we see him physically, but that we see him spiritually. That's actually what the Apostle Paul prayed for the believers in Ephesus. He prays that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened. That they would see all that they have in Christ. Actually see the fullness and the beauty of Christ. That they would perceive and recognize and respond and be changed. Let me ask you, is it possible to see things but not perceive them to see but not really see it certainly is you don't need to confirm this with my wife but she knows that I can look at something and not see it particularly in the refrigerator she doesn't know this don't tell her this but a couple days ago we had had some pizza and don't you love leftover pizza so I went in the refrigerator because normally the pizza, when it's left over, is put in one of those nice containers. So I was looking all over for the pizza, and I was just about to say, Kim, what did you do with the pizza? And then I saw the pizza box <laughs> in the refrigerator. How did I not see that? Yes, we can see things physically, but not really recognize and see and perceive and observe. And that happens spiritually as well, does it not? I believe Romans 1 speaks to that. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. It's talking about people who would look at creation where God is clearly seen, amen? But do they see him? No. They're blind to it. They don't see in creation the divine nature that is revealed there, the eternal power of the creator God. They, they can't see it. They see everything around them, but that where is God? You remember the name Yuri Gagarin? Yeah. 1960s, he was the first man to be in space and orbit the planet, the Russian cosmonaut. He came back to earth and he declared that he looked outside his capsule and didn't see God anywhere. There was a preacher of the day. He was, he was at uh, First Baptist Church in Dallas. His name was R or W.A. Criswell. He said this in response to the cosmonaut. Let him step out of his spacesuit for just one second and I'll see God quick enough. <laughs> yes, indeed. Quick enough. 
Jesus says, in my kingdom you will see God. Perceive and recognize. But notice that he connects it with being pure in heart. That's a tough connection. We need to make sure we understand what pure means. Because the first thing I thought of was, well, nobody is pure in heart. So nobody can see God. It's interesting, there's a couple different words, actually three different words that could be translated pure. The one that we see translated pure here is a word that we get our English word, catharsis. Now, I know that's not a word we use very often either, so I don't know if that helps much, but catharsis is a, is a purging, it's a releasing, it's a cleansing used normally in the sense of emotions. A catharsis of the soul, it means all that stuff you get out. So if we understand that, this is not talking about a purity of heart that is innate or inborn or natural. It's talking about a purity of heart that is come to or arrived at or achieved, maybe we could use that word. So yes, we are correct in thinking that none of us are pure in heart naturally, amen? But is there a place where we become pure in heart supernaturally? Certainly. Certainly. I think that's what he's referring to. This purity of heart that is come to and and this cleansing of heart that even allows us to see more fully God. But I want to touch on another dimension of that word pure. It doesn't just mean a cleansing of, but it refers to a singleness of, a purity of focus, a not being mixed together, not being tainted, a singleness of focus, an integrity of the heart. And there's a number of passages that talk about that, of this single focus of the heart. The Apostle Paul, as he writes to the Philippians, he says this, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but he says, but one thing I do, and then he goes on to talk about this pursuit of Jesus, this aspiration to be all that Jesus called him to be. Hebrews says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes. Do you see the single focus? In the midst of this race, there's this single and pure focus on Jesus, who's the author and the perfecter of it all. And then Jesus himself says, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. For our Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But then he says what? Seek first. Make this your Focus, make this your priority. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Boy, how easily my heart gets distracted from that pure focus. Does yours? Where everything else kind of clamors for attention and Jesus somehow gets lost in the midst of it. And that's really, I think, often the desire of the enemy, not that he gets us doing a bunch of bad things, he just gets us distracted with all these other ideas and thoughts, and we lose this sincere and pure devotion to Jesus. And notice what the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, who were getting distracted all over the place. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his coming, your thoughts will be led astray from what? From a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Pure in heart. A single focus. As God has cleansed us through Jesus. To see him even more fully. Let's keep moving. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Jesus identifies peacemakers with sons of God. And this is one of those connections to Beatitudes that really doesn't seem that odd. Some of them kind of disconnect. This one seems very normal. The sons of God being the peacemakers, yes, that should be. But I want you to notice 
it's not peace lovers, but peacemakers. Is there a difference? Is there a difference between being a lover of peace, a peace-loving person, or one who is a peacemaker? Huge difference there. I would guess that most people, if you were talk with them, say, are you a peace lover? They would say yes. Now, <laughs> I know there are a few, you've probably met them, where they just always look for a fight all the time, and they love the, the conflict. Yes, there are those, some like that, but I think for most people to say, we're peace-loving people, and yet that's not what this is referring to. Because sometimes peace lovers compromise truth for the sake of peace. Sometimes peace lovers just overlook issues and maybe make huge compromises or dismiss the issue of justice just for the sake of peace. And sometimes peace lovers just find peace by avoiding the issue. Jesus, as the Son of God, as God himself, certainly gives us the perfect example of what it is to be a peacemaker. Scripture tells us that all mankind is in, at enmity with God. And, and the biblical writers use words like enemies of God, we're hostile toward God, we hate God. Now in that sort of environment, a peace lover would probably just walk away from that to avoid the conflict and find peace, but is that what Jesus does? Certainly no. He stepped into that, didn't he? He stepped into the conflict to be able to bring peace, to be the ultimate peacemaker in far as man's relationship with his creator. I think Romans 10, or Romans 5.10 says it best. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So that verse tells us the need because we're enemies. Tells us the result, being reconciled. And then it tells us the cost. What was the cost? Say it. Death of Jesus to bring peace. Same idea is expressed in Colossians, although you were formerly alienated, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deed, yet now, yet he has now reconciled you in his flesh, his fleshly body through death. Again, you see the need, right? We're alienated, we're hostile, we're engaged in evil deeds. You see the result of reconciliation or peacemaking is reconciliation. And you see the cost. What's the costing in? It's death. Jesus is the great peacemaker because as there's a need, there's a conflict, I will step into that conflict and lay down my life that there could be peace. And so now he stands before the people and says, my kingdom is a place of peace. And my kingdom is full of those who are peacemakers. And I think by implication, those who have experienced this reconciliation with God and then extend that even into the world. We're going through the Beatitudes in a Bible study I lead over at Whispering Pines and going through a book by John Stott on this, and he made an interesting connection that I've never seen before to an Old Testament story about being a peacemaker. Let me just share it with you. Three characters in the story. One is David. The other is a man named Nabal. And his wife is Abigail. How many of you know this story? This is for the rest of you then, okay? If you know it, check your phone for right now, because I'm going to tell this story, all right? So, Nabal, parents, never name your son Nabal. Just don't. Just cross that off the list, because the word means fool, now, why his mom named him this, I can't have a, I don't have a clue, but he's a fool, and the story shows, and I would say from the story, he's a cantankerous, heavy-drinking fool that finds himself at odds with everybody. And in the story, David is the one that he's at odds with, because 
Well, David kind of blessed him in some ways, and, and Nabal said, I don't care. What, who are you? Just get out of here. And David doesn't respond to that. Now, at this point, David is not king. He's actually a fugitive, and he's got kind of a motley crew of, of men around him that basically are vicious warriors. Read the story. It's amazing how, the, how these men just are powerful men. And so David's response to the fool is, I'm going to kill him and every man connected to him. A bit harsh, but that was the reality. Enter Abigail, the fool's wife. Now, if Abigail was a peace lover, she would have just avoided this and taken Nabal's American Express card and just take off and uh, you deal with your junk because you did it. But she doesn't. What does she do? She steps right into this. And there's, there's a couple amazing quotes uh, from 1 Samuel 25. She steps in and she falls at the feet of David and says, On me alone, my Lord, be the blame. Was it her fault? No, but she steps into that and says, Man, this is, this is going nowhere fast. And I'll take the blame. And then she goes on to make a sacrifice and give David these huge blessings of lots of stuff for him and his soldiers. That's an amazing example in a very real-life situation of what a peacemaker does. They step into that, and as appropriate, they say, okay, I'll own this, and then what do I need to give to bring peace here? So Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker. Abigail gives us a very practical example of that. And I don't know what that would mean for you or for me as we are kingdom walkers to be peacemakers in this world. Certainly, certainly it means presenting the gospel, amen, because that's ultimately the avenue by way by which people can be at peace with God. But maybe as we're presenting the gospel, it's stepping into some lives and and bearing a burden and making a sacrifice for the sake of peace. Maybe in human relationship, but, but primarily in relationship with God. I don't know all the implications of that for you. Just as I was praying this morning, knowing that some of your life stories Maybe that's very specific about how you need to step into something to bring those kingdom principles to bear in a conflicted situation. Well, then it gets really deep. Then Jesus just kind of like jumps in the deep end and says, hope you can follow me here. Because what he says next in verse 10 must have raised some eyebrows. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if you had this whole scripture in front of you, you would see that he begins and he, and he ends with the kingdom of heaven because the first beatitude said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the what? Kingdom of heaven. And then he comes right back to it and he ends with, those who are persecuted, and theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in Hebrew communication and and literature, that was a very common thing to do, to start here and to end here and to kind of wrap it all up in that way. So we have here this reminder of these kingdom qualities, and it seems to me as I try to process this is that he's saying, this is the result of being in my kingdom. This is the result of living out these kingdom values. Jesus says, if you follow me as the king and and these kingdom values become a part of your life and you're humble and, and you see sin for what it is and you're a peacemaker and you're pure in heart and you're merciful, the end result is what? <laughs> you get persecuted, so be happy about that. Yeah. Sounds a bit crazy, doesn't it? It really does sound a bit crazy, but this is the point he ends on. But I need to make sure we understand 
some of the clarifications. He says, you're blessed when you've been persecuted for what? For the sake of righteousness. These are people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These are the ones who see Jesus as this righteous one and there's this pursuit of righteousness in following Jesus. That word persecute, it means basically to pursue, to to press hard after, and, and it would be used in pursuing criminals. It would be used to pursue your enemies. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for the sake of righteousness. That's an important clarification. Because I've talked with some believers, and they share with great excitement how they were having a conversation with somebody, and it got heated, and they, this person started yelling at him and cussing at them because of what they were saying. And I'm thinking as I'm listening to him, yeah, I get that. I kind of like to yell and cuss at you because you're so annoying. You're just annoying. The way you present yourself is so annoying and rude and obnoxious. I can understand why people yell at you. There's no blessing when people yell at you because you're rude or obnoxious or dishonoring to them. There's no blessing in that. That's completely contrary to kingdom values. Persecuted for the sake of righteousness when there's this righteous standard, this righteous king that we're pursuing. Now it's interesting that this beatitude there in verse 10, Jesus makes some additional comments and brings some more clarification. I don't know why verse 11 and 12 are there, why those additional comments are there. Maybe Jesus says what he says in verse 10, and he sees the reaction. <laughs> People cocking their head, what? People lazing their eyebrows, maybe turning to somebody and saying, did he just really say that? Now, I don't know, that's your, I, I don't know. All I know is I'm glad that he, verse, or he, he verbalized what is in verse 11 and 12 because it gives great clarification to this upside-down way of thinking. Because in these statements in verse 11 and 12, he does three things for us. Let me just read them. It says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for our reward in heaven is great. Your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He does three things. First of all, he makes it personal. Do you see that? In this expanded view, he says it's about you. See, all the other Beatitudes were kind of could be somebody else, but he says, no, this is, this is about you. Five times he uses the word you there. Now it's not just a general statement of truth. Now Jesus directs it a little more personally. He says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you. Have any of you ever look at a sign that says, don't enter, and you think, that doesn't apply to me? Some of us listen to sermons that way. That doesn't apply to me. It applies to my spouse, my kids, and my neighbors, but certainly not me. And I, I'm wondering if some were listening to Jesus' words, and that didn't apply to me. I'm one of those types of people. Speed limit signs don't apply to me, do they you? Yeah, they do. <laughs> don't enter, don't touch, authorize personnel only, that does apply to me. It's something I'm reading, and, and it's just interesting. Jesus say, no, this is about you. And, and so I just want to seize that these words are for you, each one of us here today, that, that there's something here for you. This isn't just for all the other people, it's for you. Then he makes it very practical, and I think particularly for us, because one could ask, what does it mean to be persecuted? 
I don't know what's in your mind when you just hear the word persecuted. I told you it just means to pursue or to be in pursuit of. But for me, when I think of the word persecuted, I think of the Apostle Paul who was stoned and put in prison. I think of Stephen who was stoned to death. I think of James who was killed with a sword in some way. I think of Hugh Latimer one of our brothers from the past who was burned at the stake. I think of some of our partners in India who have been beaten and separated from their families. They were persecuted, amen? But that hadn't happened to me. So have I been persecuted? Have you been persecuted? So Jesus gives some clarification, makes it practical. He says, this persecution means people insult you. That means to disgrace you or to verbally abuse you, to shame you, to find fault and demean you. That could be translated, say evil about you. Can you relate to that? I can relate to that. Now, usually they don't say it to me. I usually hear (laughs) through the grapevine in the community, so-and-so said this about you. I thought, all right, got it. Now, Luke, these words are recorded, and they're even expanded further. Luke 6 says, Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil. The word ostracize, it means literally to set up a boundary, to to separate. So it means to be separated because of your pursuit of righteousness. Now, maybe we're not put in prison, but have any of you ever been separated or excluded or disregarded because of your stand for Christ? So back to Matthew. Jesus says that persecution means to say all kinds of evil against you, to just speak poorly of who you are to other people or maybe even directly to you. There's a West African idiom that says to spoil your name. And I even think of the name Christian in our culture. It has been spoiled, has it not? If you watch any movie, any presentation in the media, a Christian is always presented in a degrading way. And, And they present a gross caricature of the reality of what it means to be a Christian. Now, I'm not saying we pat ourselves on the back because, yeah, maybe we have been persecuted, but it's just a clarification. It's much broader than just some sort of physical harm that would come to us. Sometimes it's a harm to our reputation, to the relationships even around us. So Jesus makes this truth about persecution personal, and then he makes it practical, and then I just want you to see this important thing. He shows the potential in it. He says in verse 12, Rejoice and be glad for the persecution. Look close at that verse. Are you rejoice and be glad because of the persecution? No. Rejoice and be glad because there's this potential, this great reward that is future. In that rejoice. In that be glad. It's important that we see that the rejoicing and the gladness of heart is not related to the present pain of the persecution It's related to the potential reward that comes from it. Because to rejoice and be glad because of pain, there's a name for that. That's just weird. It's just weird. And he's not saying be weird and and get excited that you have this pain. No, be excited that through this pain, through this experience, there is a reward. I can't imagine Jesus 
rejoicing and being glad in the pain of the cross itself. But certainly I could say he rejoiced and gloried in what that produced. Amen? That's what moved him ahead. So this rejoicing comes not because of what is happening in the present, but the potential reward that comes from the present pain. And Scripture is always reminding us. Scripture is always exhorting us to look beyond, to look beyond the present to something that is eternal and lasting. Now Luke, again, adds another response. Read this for me on the screen. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. All right. Leap for joy. Leap for joy. Not because of the pain, but because there's a reward in heaven for this pain. And in that moment, you can leap for joy. Does that seem crazy to anybody? All right, if it doesn't seem crazy, I don't think you're getting the point of what he's saying. That's an actual physical response of joy because of what this future reward might be based on this present pain. If you picked up your mail Monday and you opened up an envelope and there it's an envelope from your old lost Uncle Buck. I don't know if you have an Uncle Buck, but and there's a $10 million check in there for you. What would you do? Maybe move a little bit. Now, maybe you wouldn't leap. Maybe you wouldn't jump down. But you say there's, wow, that's for me. No doubt for all of us there would be a physical response to that reality. And, and the challenge that all of us are faced with is unhinging our mind on all these temporary things and attaching it to that reality of the future, the reality of a reward, the reality of the blessing, the reality of great glory to Jesus because of the pain of the moment. Some of you are familiar with Voice of the Martyrs. The founder of Voice of the Martyrs was Richard Rumbrandt. Interesting story, I just spent some time reading about him. If you have opportunities, read about this man. He actually wrote a number of books. One of them is Tortured for Christ. He, in the 40s, was, the pastor in, was a pastor in Romania. Because of his faith in Christ, because of um, him preaching Jesus, he was put in prison for a total of 14 years and underwent great torture. Um, in speaking engagements, he would say, let me show you my back, and and just huge chunks of flesh torn out of his back. In reading a story, they would take the bottom of his feet and beat them till the skin would come off. For three of those 14 years, he was in solitary confinement in a pit 30 feet down in the ground where it was absolutely silent and dark. And he writes that one of the ways that he endured that was by crafting sermons in his mind and then delivering them. It just kept him focused on the word of God. He writes, at one point being overcome with sheer joy to the point of standing up very feebly and dancing around the cell confident that the angels were dancing with him. Can you imagine that? Literally standing and, and dancing around in joy, knowing that God was with him and a reward that was yet future. When he was unexpectedly released from prison, he looked like a scarecrow. All the teeth were rotted out of his mouth. And as he was walking away from the prison, somebody, uh, um, a, a, a woman that evidently was, had some fruit, offered him a strawberry and he said no thank you I'm going to fast <laughs> amazing 
And then he went home with his wife, and the first thing they did is they, they knelt down and prayed and continued to fast and ask this, ask that they would experience the same joy outside of the prison that he had experienced inside the prison. Here's a man so focused on his kingdom, on his king, on his king and his king's kingdom, that he was able to leap for joy. I love that story. See, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of which Jesus is the king of, full of those who see life here for what it is, temporary, fleeting, quickly passing, and their hearts and their minds are fixated on that which lasts, the king that endures forever and the kingdom that never changes. Yeah, do you ever feel like Jesus' words are just upside down? I just, again, think that sometimes we read through Jesus' words, eh, whatever, and we don't recognize how revolutionary they are, how much they would transform our lives if we just, man, that's his kingdom. His kingdom and the values of his kingdom are absolutely upside down to the kingdom that we live in in this world. And yet I think we've gone blind to that. By the way, did you know that right now physically you're seeing everything upside down? Do you know that? Okay, do the research this afternoon. Things come into your eye, they get turned upside down. So on your retina, everything is upside down right now. And your mind, your brain has the ability to turn it right side up so you can function. They've done amazing studies over the years by putting lenses in front of people's eyes and leaving them long term. The lenses turn everything upside down. And after about eight days, what happens? Their brains turn it right side up. I thought about that this week. We need the lens of Scripture to be this thing that we look through constantly so that we can see things with the kingdom values. Those are the right values. But our kingdom, the kingdom that we live in, is constantly turning it upside down and say, no, this is the way to live. May God help us, amen? May God help us hear from the king. May God help us see through the lens of Scripture so we can live right now in light of the kingdom that never ends. Please, God, help us. Please, God, by your Holy Spirit, uh, even now bring things to our mind and our heart that maybe we're just upside down in. Lord, whatever it is, and as you do that, Holy Spirit, would you give us the power to actually repent and turn away from that and, and start pursuing you, Jesus, our King? So God help us. Holy Spirit, change us. Jesus, would you become more and more and more the dominant view in our minds and our hearts? So even as we sing... Jesus, we sing because of you, we sing for you, we sing because of the work that you've done in us and that you're continuing to do in us.